Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Gavin Ortland of Truth Unites. Um, you know, to this today's episode is just to get to know Gavin episode. It's really going to be cordial. Um, you know, last time I was that we met on Capturing Christianity, we had a debate, and uh, even then it was cordial, and I thought it was friendly. But uh, this time, I just want to get to know you, Gavin, more because um, it's kind of funny. I remember I talked to um, a pastor friend of mine. So he he was formerly you know, Protestant pastor, he became Catholic. And I told him that I had debated Gavin Ortland on Capturing Christianity. And he said, Ortland, oh, he must be from the Ortland family. And I didn't realize at the time that, okay, there's something more to that last name. So I thought, hey, I should get to know you more, Gavin. So thank you so much for coming on to my show. Oh, man, it's so kind of you to have me. Thanks. Thanks for doing this one. Yeah. And, you know, the, the book that you recently published came in the other day um, for me. So I got my copy, although it's not here with me because I'm in my house in Kansas City, not in my college town. But um, okay. could you just talk a little bit about the book that you just published? Yeah, I got a copy right here so people can see the cover. Yeah, thanks for letting me do that. Yeah, it came out last week. Um, actually, it's Saturday that we're recording this. So it came out five days ago. Mm. Um, it's called Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. Uh, the subtitle is The Beauty of Christian Theism. And basically, it's an argument for the existence of God. And I just canvas four classical arguments, but I take a little different approach. I um, put them in a narrative frame. So I mm. treat each of these arguments as one aspect of a story. So like the moral argument becomes the drama of the story, the conflict mm. of the story. The argument from Christ's resurrection becomes the hope of the story, kind of like that. And then I also talk about the emotions of the arguments and kind of their um, their appeal to beauty and basically saying, this is a more plausible story than particularly naturalism, but also it's just a better story. Yeah, uh, it's a more, uh, it's a story that's more dignifying to human beings that can enrich your experience as a human being in many ways. So that's kind of the, a basic overview. So if people are interested in it, hopefully they'll, they can find it anywhere, Amazon or whatever. Yeah, and I appreciate the fact that you talk about the beauty of Christian theism, because I think that's so underappreciated. You know, people want to present arguments, you know, and they're kind of rigid and cold, right? But then uh, when, you, when you look at just the deeper human need for beauty, for a world and reality that not only makes sense of things, but invites them, makes them feel at home in the world. I mean, once you really tap into that human need, you can't shut it off, so to speak. Right, exactly. And this is something the Catholic tradition has has emphasized so well. I mean, I, I quote far more Catholics than Protestants in this book, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, Peter Kreeft, I quote all over, and mm -hmm. um, Blaise Pascal is the one who really helped me the most. He's He was the most formative person for the book, because I just real quickly, he starts, I start off the book quoting him where he basically says, people are afraid that religion, by which he means Christianity, might be true. So you can't just argue that it's true. You have to start further back. And he says, you have to show them that it's respectable. Then you have to show them that it's desirable. Mm -hmm. And so that second of those steps is where I'm trying to get at. And, and the way I put it at the beginning is if the gospel is true and you go from naturalism to that, it feels like waking up on, on Christmas morning as a little boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like the most wonderful to, to contemplate that Jesus rose from the dead is the most wonderful possibility. And that doesn't prove that it's true, but it at least might arrest someone's attention. Right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so also backing up just a little bit, I want to begin by just talking about, um, you know, what, so tell me, tell me about Truth Unites, you know, what, what got you started with Truth Unites and what's the purpose of it? Yeah, this has been such a fun experiment. And of course, it's embarrassing to go back and watch your first videos and you <laughs> see all, you know, how much you, you learn along the way, but um yeah, I think I just have had a sense that there's so many people right now who are uh, wrestling with what do I believe, especially I've, had, I've known so many of my friends who have deconstructed their faith, or they're just really disillusioned. Um, you know, there, there's such a sense of disintegration in, in our world right now. And I'm sure there's many causes for that politically, culturally, there's so much polarization happening. I think a lot of people are just, you know, wrestling with deep questions. And so many of the people I know and I interact with, they're, they're certainly not going to come to my church. Um, they probably won't read my books. <laughs> Much as I uh, wish that, you know, I, I write a book trying, hoping it's accessible. A lot of people don't necessarily read books 
on these kinds of topics, but they might watch a YouTube video. And so the originating motive for me was really more in the realm of apologetics. You know, I described my channel as um, uh, apologetics and theology, trying to have an ironic approach. I thought that the apologetics would be more the emphasis. It's actually become just the opposite. I've been pulled more into theology. But the originating motive was just wanting to provide a voice that's constructive and helpful for people who are wrestling with deep questions, and then just making a winsome case for, um, in some cases, the Protestant faith, in other cases, just the Christian faith, and and trying to have an ironic approach. I That is something I'm trying to do. Partly, I just think that's part of the need of the times right now. You know, the, it's interesting thinking about how popular the character Ted Lasso is, and also other uh, figures in our culture, like Mr. Rogers, who are kind. Yeah, And I, yeah. I actually believe there's a thirst for kindness. I actually believe people are aching for kindness. And so part of that is just a strategy of amidst all the outrage and hatred. I think one way we can try to commend the gospel to people is we were just talking about this is just mm -hmm. whatever else we do, try to practice kindness. And that's not compromise. That doesn't mean we're not forceful in argumentation, but it's just more sort of how we argue and how we treat people. So that's something I aspire to. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. it's always a work in progress. Yeah, I remember growing up hearing the um, the phrase truth with grace, right? So or even or even in uh, was it first Peter chapter three, verse 15, when he says, do you know, when you defend the gospel, when you give the reason for the hope within you do so with gentleness and respect. You know, that's that's apostolic wisdom. That's not just wisdom that we've developed for the time, right? Like, you know, Gavin and I are just being nice because, you know, we're trying to just be the most effective salesman for the gospel. No, it's like that's biblical, you know, defending the faith in gentleness and respect. But um, backing up just a little bit more then. Um, so apparently the last name Ortland is famous. And so I wanted to learn more about uh, more about that. <laughs> okay, I'm always happy to explain this so that less people will quote me as the author of Gentle and Lowly on Twitter, which happens a lot, <laughs> which is a book that my brother wrote. So, oh, yeah. um, so just some of the basics. So my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad is Ray Ortland Sr. And he was he and my grandmother were in ministry for many years. And um, they wrote some books, all kind of devotional books, um, not really theology. And my grandmother was a musician. And so she wrote some hymns. Um, and then I do have a couple of uncles who are in ministry. And then my dad uh, <laughs> and my mom are in ministry. And they've written some books and done some things like that. So it, it actually was a big struggle for me going into ministry and thinking, am I just doing this because it's what my family has done? And I, for a long time, I just felt like it would be inauthentic for me to be a pastor because I felt like, well, how do I know if I'm just doing this because of what my family has done? And then finally, I kind of realized my family is not a reason to go into ministry, but it's also not a reason not to, you know, I just have to follow what Christ is calling me to do. But, uh, and then I have three older siblings. Uh, all of them are just amazing people. I admire so much my older sister, Krista. And then I have two brothers, Eric and Dane. And Eric teaches theology at an Anglican school in London. And Dane is a Presbyterian minister. So we have lots of fun discussions about different things. And um, they've both written a little bit, uh, a, a few books and things like that. So that's a little overview. Yeah. So basically a Protestant royalty, right? You're in the Ortland <laughs> dynasty, right? <laughs> I'm, the, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole for sure. <laughs> oh, man. Well, in my eyes, Gavin, you're quite high up there. But um, so, you know, I'm going back to kind of just, you know, your family and just your story of growing up, right? I mean, you know, you had these questions about it when you entered ministry, like, hey, am I doing this just because my family, right, is just has this history of ministers and uh, people who have been Christian writers. But then I'm, I'm wondering, you know, even when you were growing up, did you ever think about like, man, maybe I'm just Christian because my family's Christian, Mm -hmm. um, did you did you wrestle with your Christian faith at all or have any significant doubts? Yes, I did. Um, not when I was younger. When I was younger, I wasn't I didn't really have a very vibrant walk with Christ in a, mm -hmm. through like eighth grade. Um, I think I would have called myself a Christian, but I, I was just more interested in sports and other things. Um, when I got into high school, I got really involved in my youth group, and that's when I sort of came alive spiritually. Um, and then when I was in college, I went through a season of angst and <clears throat> I've had one or two, really one of those since then as well, that has given me a lot of sympathy for people who are, again, going back to my desire to be helpful to those who are wrestling with things. Cause I, I do think sometimes 
we act as though faith is always easy. Um, mm -hmm. At least in the context I've grown up in, sometimes that's been the feeling where we don't really, I don't know, doubt can be kind of a scary thing where people don't know, like, is it okay to have doubts sometimes? Or what do I do when I have doubts? And there can be sometimes kind of a stigma with that. But it is helpful to see like all the apostles struggled with doubt at times. And of course, we've got Thomas in particular, and it always is encouraging to remember Thomas is not Judas. You know, you can be doubting and still be a genuine believer or struggle at times with, with uh, believing. But yeah, so when I was in college, I think the two things, one would be the doctrine of hell. That was really, I, I just uh, really struggled to understand how um, it, it's just such a terrible thing to consider. And when you really love your non-Christian friends, it really is um, a bracing thought. And I just remember just the basic question of how does this square with the goodness of God? Um, you know, that's that's when I still have great sympathy for if someone is, is wrestling with that. But I think I've made some progress on that. But um, but still, that that is, a, you know, that's not a not a minor challenge to consider how do we provide a good response to that. So that was a big one. And then also science and faith issues. So like creation, evolution, that debate, all of that stuff I started wading into when I was in college. <clears throat> and even though I didn't have a real deep uh, level of understanding, what I did understand was enough to generate a lot of angst and a lot of questions. So that's been sort of an ongoing issue. I've kind of kept coming back to at different times in my intellectual development from then. Those would be two of the big ones that I had to work through yeah. at that time. I mean, so I'm interested in then hearing how you dealt with both of those, right? So like, you know, your current position, so to speak. I mean, obviously, I know that you're an Orthodox Christian, so to speak. So you're not going to, you're not going to throw out hell, right? Um, right. But how, how have you, first, let's just talk about hell. How have you dealt with that particular issue in your own okay. life? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah, to be clear, I do believe in hell. Um, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's something that one of the things that's always struck me is that Jesus himself spoke so luridly of hell. And so to be a Christian means we submit to Christ. We follow Christ. We're not, I'm not my own Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. So that includes so many things, but one of them is I need to accept his teaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if he says something that I don't understand, then I bow and worship and say, help me to understand better. But I, I don't just reject it, you know, so, but um, I have made some progress on that. And I don't fully go down with C.S. Lewis in the way that he thinks of hell and uh, various of his writings um, the Great Divorce and other other writings, but uh, he has helped me to, uh, and I, I've written an article about this where the phrase that the article is uh, titled is a losing battle against reality. And then the sub subtitle is C.S. Lewis on the nature and necessity of hell. And I think, you know, C.S. Lewis, so he has the idea of hell is our choice. The, the gates are shut from the inside out. People go to hell because God says to them, okay, you can have what you want. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, lots of famous passages where he's proposed that idea. I, in the article, I argue his views are a little more nuanced. It's not like he own. that's not like the only thing he ever says about hell. He also believes it to be a divine judgment. And I basically argue that some aspects of that idea are compatible with thinking of hell as a place to which a person is sent or cast. Mm -hmm. And that, um, it, it, at least to this extent, C.S. Lewis has helped me to think about hell as something that is in accord with the nature of what evil is. And so the, the article I just talked through, you know, think about what God is. If God is the source of all that is good, then what could it be? And this is what C.S. Lewis says, you know, if, if you reject the only food on which the universe grows, what can mm -hmm. you do but starve forever? And he, so C.S. Lewis has helped me think about hell as a less arbitrary thing. It's not like yeah. God designed to built a torture chamber to throw people into. It's that anything that is good comes from God. That's what God is. There could be nothing good that doesn't come from God because God is the source of all that is good. And that really helped me, you know, that helped me understand hell less as an arbitrary thing and more just as a sort of the logical fallout of what it means to be severed from God and then be, go into a state of eternity like that. So in the article, I talk about the nature of God helping me think about hell and then also the nature of evil mm -hmm. as, a, as a, a choice away from God. So um, 
yeah, some, some of the insights of C.S. Lewis have really helped me um, come to appreciate how hell can make, I think in the article I talk about how, you know, hell is the kind of thing you'd expect in, the, in a Christian metaphysic, because if you have real choice and you have a, a God as the source of all good, yeah, you know, how could that not be an option on the table? You know, right. Mm. Um, so anyway, C.S. Lewis has helped me with that one. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the fact that, at least in my own faith development, um, more recently, I've been having to deal with a universalist objections, right? And I had a big debate on universalism on my channel. And so um, I, I've, I've been developing my own view of the afterlife that I think has helped make more sense. And it's like also it's a grander theodicy that I think helps make sense of a lot of these things. And so if you go on my academia.edu page, I have a paper called Almost Apocatastasis. And so it's kind of like I'm trying to marry together universalism and traditional, um, you know, what the traditional teaching of the Christian tradition has been, right? And trying to see like, okay, I see the universalist intuition, the desire. So how do I marry that? And so it's, a, it's the attempt to get the best of both without compromising on scripture and tradition. Fascinating. And I launched into this topic without any awareness of where your views are. So <laughs> yeah, I, but I'm so yeah, well, I don't know if I, you want to talk about that more now. Sometime I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that might have to be for another time. But uh, Gavin, let's talk about the evolution in Christianity, right? This is also a hot button one. Um, and actually, <clears throat> I don't know if you um, if you saw, I think um, it was Joshua Swamidas. He mm -hmm. has, you know, this uh, website called, I think it's Peaceful Science or something like that. And um, <clears throat> I wrote up my, uh, my story about when I became agnostic in high school. And it was William Lane Craig who brought me back into the faith. And it had to do with the problem of evolution and natural evil. Ah. And so, you know, I had that angle to the problem. But I'm interested in like how you approach the problem, right, in, in particular. Yeah, yeah, that, that what you just articulated, the problem of natural evil, um, that is right there that is that is the main thing and then with that would be just this more general sense of the weirdness of evolution <laughs> which is not you know it's not an argument mm -hmm. it's just kind of this worry like really you know 13 billion years um there's dinosaurs for that long you know like really um it takes that long to get to the image bearers you know why would god do it that way that mm -hmm. that kind of just worry i guess so yeah and then the problem of natural evil um yeah that 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 is another one i've written about reflected upon at great length and um yeah again c.s lewis has helped me um and you mentioned william lane craig i just did a great interview with him where he he's helped me a lot he of course has addressed this issue more more recently um yeah i mean what i think where i've basically landed is after about 12 years of really really wrestling with it coming to peace with the fact that i have more questions now mm -hmm. <laughs> after 12 years than at the beginning which is uh if that's not a testimony to how intellectual progress often happens i don't know what is you know it's mm. a because uh, it's just generated, you know, you, you you reach resolution on one thing, but then that sends out like 12 ripple effects. And you're like, now I've got all these new questions, you know. So, but basically where I've landed is just more openness and, and caution about what judgments to make about the natural order. So like one of the things that's really helped me is, yeah, 13 billion years is a long time. But then again, the universe is pretty big. And why are you trusting your intuitions of age or size? You know, I mean, because the same thing can be made is like if God's going to make his image bearers and they're going to come up in the like the metaphor I used in one of my writings is it's like sending in your best players to the game in the final two seconds of the game. You know, <laughs> it's like, why wait so long to bring your image bearers along, you know, but then the metaphor that I used to check myself and in that intuition is, yeah, but it's also like painting this massive painting and putting the most beautiful or important object in, in some in it, in infinitesimal spot in the corner mm. um you know we all have to face the fact that our intuitions just aren't reliable to say here's what god should do or here's how god should create the world or how it should look and so that just humbles me to say um, and then if you look down the other road and that's what my book is all about it's just the the dreariness and dreadfulness of naturalism um you look down the road in the other direction that there's no help there um there's no answer there and I come back to, so my basic journey there has just been to come back to more solid conviction around the, the basics. I, I'm really strongly convinced there's 
good reasons to believe that God exists. And I'm really strongly convinced there's good reasons to believe that Christ rose from the dead. So then I build outward from there. As I'm building, I have less certainty about various things here and there. But because I'm so certain of those things, I don't have as much anxiety as I'm kind of working through other things. Um, so I'm, I am more open to evolution at this point, but I, and I have lots of thoughts about the different models of how to coordinate that with like a historical Adam and Eve, which I mm -hmm. would affirm. Um, but that's where the questions come in. <laughs> that's where yeah, I'm like, right. this is really complicated. I have a lot of patience for those discussions. Yeah. And this is also an issue that I've thought a lot about. So I appreciate hearing the fact that like, we're kind of on the same page with some of these issues, you know, but also um, the point you made about intuitions. I think that's so important because um, I think intuitions, uh, they're reliable in the sense that I feel like they are picking up on truth, but they're not like infallible intuitions, right? Where it's like, oh, just immediately with the intuition, whatever belief follows from that, that must be just the end of the discussion, right? Because obviously you get new evidence, you start learning more about God, then you start learning more about creation, you realize, wait a minute, okay, um, that intuition was picking up on something, but it wasn't the whole truth, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, I, I do get the point though about there is like an awkwardness, so to speak, about sending in your play, your best players in the last two seconds of the game. I kind of like that analogy, but um, I like the other one you used as well. You know, the most precious piece going into a small spot, but that doesn't make it any less precious to you. Mm -hmm. um, so then, Gavin, what thinkers have influenced you? You know, in your in your theological formation, obviously C.S. Lewis is one of them, but who else would you put on the list? Yeah. C.S. Lewis is one, he's my favorite writer. I mean, to me, the ideal day off is if it's like a rainy day, mm. extra cup of coffee, and then just pick up one of my favorite novels of C.S. Lewis. I, I go back to him again and again. I've talked a lot about Anselm in some of my other videos. He's my favorite theologian. I did my dissertation on Anselm. I just love so much about, I love the ontological argument. And I also just love Anselm's writings spiritually and rhetorically and his whole approach to theology i find very reverent and just uh, the faith seeking understanding approach so i could talk a lot about anselm too the other thing i haven't talked as much about is i was a philosophy major in college and i really uh, just i think i've started to enjoy study in that context especially studying existentialist philosophy mm -hmm. so kierkegaard was the main guy i went through you know so many of us have had a kierkegaard phase <laughs> and i had a i had a, a big kierkegaard phase where i look back as it's kind of funny now i think back i was like kierkegaard quotes in the signature to my emails and you know i was very into kierkegaard and he influenced me a, a, a huge amount but also the kind of the atheist existentialists mm. and uh, i actually have several journal entries from that time in my life where i'm wrestling with these thinkers like i remember reading through camus mm. um his book the myth of sisyphus where he's basically saying the basic idea of the book is life is absurd so should we commit suicide <laughs> and the answer is no and here's why and that's his philosophy but it's the way he describes that like emotionally i can appreciate some of what he's saying life and that's why i love the book of ecclesiastes in the bible yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it it gives us some space to say yeah in a fallen world life does feel like that sometimes and so um yeah so reading those guys um and then sartre and others um was a huge part of my my journey and that's and just the philosophy for some reason has always been and that's why i kind of have gone back to writing this book on apologetics i just that i i absolutely love um philosophical thinking that's a little bit more what i'm wired for more than theology so um, and then pascal he's he's the other one who's really influenced me especially in, in that vein like doing apologetics i think pascal's wager is often misunderstood but mm -hmm. taken in its best way I think it's a really profound and unique contribution to these whole issues and kind of how to think about. I think what Pascal's wager emphasizes is the unavoidability of making a decision about God. We've got to do something, even if just not thinking about it is what we right. decide to do. Mm -hmm. We've all got a wager. We've all got to do something. And Pascal sort of confronts us with that. And I just find he's got a lot of insights in the way he does that. Yeah, Pascal's such a great writer. Um, but speaking of Anselm, I mean, would you identify then as a classical theist? Or I know that you had a video on your channel about divine simplicity, but what are your thoughts on all that? 
Yes, I am a classical theist. Um, this is one of many points where I'd be in really good company with Catholic friends, uh, more so than with certain Protestant circles. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I think for me, a huge part of my development on these things was I did a study on divine simplicity in medieval and patristic theology. And uh, that was really formative for me. That was, uh, I think, my third PhD seminar. And it was just a directed reading, so like an independent study. And I just poured through a lot of the classical texts. And that was really a, a occasion for me to go deeper into why I love historical theology so much and why I think it's so um, useful and kind of formative to just engage in these historical texts because they teach you different ways of thinking and um, different ways to approach a question like this. And I just basically became convinced that the particular way of thinking about God that's represented by classical theism, thinking of God as absolutely metaphysically unique, uh, affirming his simplicity, his impassibility, eternity, doctrines like this. Aseity is one I've done more work in recently, the idea that God exists from himself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I've written on more recently. And yeah, I, I do believe in those things. I think that, I think one of the, just to say one thing about it, one of the modern worries is that this makes God kind of frozen and static, you know, but my, what I've arrived upon in terms of my conviction about that is that it's just the opposite. Right. <laughs> that uh, these actually allow us to relate to God in a more meaningful way, um, the, to consider God as simple or impassable, for example. So, yes, I'm a, I'm a classical theist. And um, yeah, that, and that, those are things I care about because I do think they're really important. And certainly speaking for my neck of the woods, in the more low church evangelical world, they're often... Um, not only rejected, but rejected so lightly and so glibly. Right. And so I'm really burdened about that. Well, then, I mean, I know a lot of Protestants would say, but the problem is that scripture doesn't seem to support the tenets of classical theism, right? So for instance, God seems to change in the Bible, right? So take uh, the story of Joshua convincing God to keep the sun still, right? Um, think about uh, the, the situations in which God seems to be very emotionally active, right? You know, and they'll, they'll cite all sorts of examples, Um uh, or even, you know, some will say that, well, the incarnation must have been a real change in God, right, when he entered into creation. So how can you believe all these things, Swan and Gavin, you know, like, uh, how, how would you respond to kind of that, that scriptural objection to classical theism? Yeah, well, let me say one thing about this. I'm, I'm actually really curious if you have any thoughts on this, too. So feel free to chime in, too. But I, one thing that really helped me is just thinking, well, actually, two, two quick things. One is that I do think that this is one of those areas where we do have to get beyond a simplistic, my wife and I always joke about this language, but a me and my Bible approach yeah. um, where it's like, if I don't have a chapter and verse for it, then I don't believe it, you know, which is not a very sophisticated way of doing theology, even with a very high view of scripture, um, because there are just questions and categories that arise that aren't necessarily the exact ones that scripture uses or addresses that we'll need to respond to and um, clarify and so forth. So um, I do think these doctrines can be located in scripture. I also think, and this is the second thing, is very often these doctrines are caricatured. Take the doctrine of impassibility, for example, the, God is, the idea that God is not subject to passions. That really doesn't mean that we can never speak of God uh, expressing emotion in any sense. So um, one of the, I think it's J.I. Packer who has a, a definition where he's basically saying God has God is Lord of his own emotions or something like that. Mm. And uh, some of it comes down to language, you know, to what extent can, how, how exactly do we talk about God? But um, what I think it's trying to protect is the absolute uniqueness of God his utter difference from us in how he functions. In, in, so um, if you take away the caricatures, or simplicity is often caricatured as well. Um, but uh, And what's really helped me with that is recognizing God is absolutely other. He's absolutely unique. He's in his own category. So we have to be so cautious in applying um, creaturely categories to the divine nature. Mm -hmm. You know, as though, because in other words, if someone says, well, if God is simple, if God's essence and, and his uh, 
attributes are identical, uh, if God is identical with all of his attributes, then God can't be personal, or God can't be Trinitarian, or God must be, um, that we must not be able to distinguish one attribute from another, and this kind of thing. You know, you hear all these responses. Right. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, they seem like they're assuming a kind of univocal relationship between creatures and the creator. And this is the great thing I take from the tradition, is that we can't do that. God is <laughs> absolutely unique we are utterly dependent upon his revelation to speak of him and to understand him so um but i'm, I'm curious what you would say about this because I, I, you've thought about these things a lot as well you're talking about the biblical objections to classical theism or yeah and mm-hmm. yeah yeah the, the just this whole topic of classical theism because you know yeah i because i can understand sympath- i can sympathize with someone at their initial like the first time you ever hear the idea that god is simple I can understand how someone is saying, why would anyone ever believe that? You know, it right. seems weird to say about God, but then the more you get into it, it's like, oh, this is, an, this is really important. Like this, this is one of those hallmark distinctives that sets off creator from creation. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just. No, that's good. Because I think like the mystery that I begin with is the Trinity. Right. Because I feel like the Trinity is where you get the doctrine of analogy or this idea that you can't really apply creaturely categories really neatly into the reality of God. And so, like, you know, we'll use examples. Right. But we acknowledge that all these examples, if they're taken too far, they get into a heresy about maybe causing division in the Godhead or so on and so forth. And so, you know, that Trinitarian relationship, it's it's so unique to God that nothing really in creation can have that relationship. Right. And so you know, it boggles our mind, right? But then that's like part of the mystery of God. And so, um, as you said before, I really liked how you emphasize the otherness of God or just the, the absolute uniqueness of him. And so part of what I think about too is just, okay, when I look at, you know, natural theology, so, you know, I believe that we can do natural theology and I look at, you know, the nature of the first cause and, you know, I use the best metaphysics that I think we have available, right? Um, I think what classical theism does a great job of is it emphasizes the fact that God is the absolute first cause, even whatever, you know, the the, the attributes and properties he has in himself, these aren't just brute kind of, you know, mashed together into what we call the maximally greatest being, but we're saying that no, like, they're not arbitrarily put together into this one reality, but really, when you get to the root of reality, the root of everything, it is full of life, full of perfection, full of just a total grasp of every moment in time and so on and so forth, right? Like all these things start coming together. And so when I look at scripture, I think about how, you know, it's human beings receiving this reality that's totally beyond them, right? And so, you know, sometimes you'll see, um, you know, people talking about how they're pleading with God and they, maybe they, it sounds like they're convincing God to change his mind or something like that, right? I would interpret that as a kind of divine accommodation on God's part. Right. You know, and also I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say that, you know, if, if God can experience all moments of time at once, right. I don't think it's impossible for him to be at least, let's say like at one moment of time. So if God experiences all moments of time at once, he doesn't experience temporal succession. He can make himself present in different ways at every moment of time at once without himself changing. Right. Because he's present in all those moments all at once without any succession. And so it would just be the case that to creatures, it looks like a change. The things that are lesser, it looks like a change or something creaturely. Right. But in reality, you know, when you look at God, the relationship is asymmetric, so to speak. Right. When we look at God and we look at our lives, we see, you know, moment A, moment B, we see a God who seems to be frustrated with us at times, a God who mourns with us. Right. Which is, you know, all true and good. But, um, on the side of the divine, it's different. And so I remember like, you know, talking to Gavin or yeah, Gavin Kerr about this, who's a really great Thomas. And he's done a great job kind of showing that this kind of asymmetric perspective, so to speak, where it's like, when God looks down at us, he sees one thing. When we look up at him, we see another. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love the way you're putting that. And yeah. And the, the thing that's so interesting is uh, in agreement with you, when we have a God who's absolutely metaphysically unique it doesn't slice him off from meaningful contact with creatures. On mm-hmm. the contrary, um, it means we can relate to God more authentically. And I remember when I was doing my study on divine simplicity, the sentence that finally came to me, you know how it is when you do lots and lots of research and then finally something like the penny drops and, and you kind of get it, is when I 
realized that this whole, and this is why I love these doctrines. When I was studying divine simplicity, it actually opened up the whole question of just what and who God is. Mm. Um, and the sentence that came to me was, um, God is not one thing within reality in relation to other things that are in reality. Reality is in God himself. Mm -hmm. And that was the turning point for me when I began to see, oh, okay. So the entire way that God will relate to his attributes uh, may be different than how a creature relates to the creature's attributes. And um, yeah, it really is. Uh, so I love studying these doctrines, these particular things like in classical theism, like divine simplicity, divine impassibility, because I feel like it opens us up to the whole nature of, of God and the whole nature of um, the theological task. Yeah, but the other thing too, just going off of something um, and what we talked about in the beginning, right? I just find classical theism so much more beautiful because, you know, like, you know, when, when you think about the fact that God isn't beautiful in the sense that, you know, he's just full of beauty, right? Where God is beauty itself. He is the standard. Or, you know, when, when you have to deal with the Euthyphro dilemma, right? Um, the way you break the horn is by saying, well, God is the good itself, you know? God is goodness itself. And so every time that I'm looking outside and I see a beautiful, you know, the leaves changing outside and I see the order and majesty of creation, I'm really seeing a faint kind of reflection of the divine reality. Or, you know, when I'm looking at someone who I love, my mother or, you know, some, a friend, and I see their beauty, I'm really seeing a hint of God himself. And it's, it's beautiful because it's like all the things that I love are really in some sense um, participating in that divine reality. They're not beautiful, separate or apart from God. It's literally like this person who's in front of me is a hymn, a living hymn reflecting the glory of God. And it's just like, whoa, you know, that reality just becomes so much more exciting, even in the mundane things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's just, that's my little spiel. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's good. Yeah, I do have a section on the Euthyphro dilemma in, in my book, and I use divine simplicity to resolve it, which yes. I do think is how, how it's done. Right. Well, Gavin, what arguments for God do you find the most convincing then? Um, yeah, the, the, this is a tough one because I love the cumulative case. Yeah. So ranking them is tough um, <laughs> because for me, they all do something different, you know? So like my favorite one, but not the one I find most convincing is the ontological argument. Yeah. And uh, I made a video about that and people can see my thoughts in other places. I think the, so the cosmological argument or the argument for God is the first cause. That one to me is uh, at least just speaking of my personal reaction to it. It's the least precise, mm -hmm. but it's the most forceful. I think of it as just like a sledgehammer that just like smacks something really hard. Um, it doesn't get you precisely to the Trinity. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Or to whatever extent it starts to gesture you towards God, that's going to be the, a less forceful um, derivation of it, but just the idea that there's a first cause, um, there's necessary being, that is such a powerful appeal that I think, so in the, in my book, that, that the first chapter is on that, and I talk about it as just putting the, a foot in the door against naturalism. Yeah. What, what the, cos, the way I summarize my personal reaction to the cosmological argument is nobody can say that, that, um, being uh, believing in something more than physical nature is unreasonable. Nobody can say that. <laughs> it's like the most, it's an extremely modest sort of inference from the nature of the world we live in to say this contingency needs some kind of necessity as its context. Mm -hmm. um, so that one to me is like really forceful like that. And in the I close chapter one of my book with a journal entry of just how I've gone back to that again and again, it's like this solid thing that you can grab a hold of. And I use the metaphor of when I was wrestling with doubts of uh, a railing on a staircase, when you're walking up the stairs and you lose your balance, you can grab the railing. The cosmological argument has been like that to me of just, it's so solid. You can just grab a hold of it. You know, it just is, it never, because every time I think about it, it kind of hits me afresh, you know, yeah. like uh, it, I talk about how if let's just take the Kalam version, for example, the idea that the universe began to exist. So what a lot of scientists think, and I kind of canvas the different alternative views as well, but like the standard model that many scientists would say is that the, the universe did come into being from nothing. So space-time itself leapt into being from nothing. Mm. Now, 
that is truly amazing because when we try to picture that, you know, when I try to picture nothing, I picture blackness, right? <laughs> but blackness is something like it's, it's, we can't fathom nothing. And so the thought that the universe would come into being from nothing, it, it, again, it like each time I think about it, it shows just the reasonableness of believing in a first cause or something beyond the, the, the space time realm. So that yeah. that's what I find most forceful. I will say that the moral argument is the one that I find most useful and the one that I think really sort of presses it more into our hearts a bit more because, you know, uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, what are called Darwinian counterfactuals. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea that if the evolutionary process had gone differently, we could have evolved different moral instincts. And the whole idea of naturalism is there's nothing outside the evolutionary process to pass judgment on which direction it goes. Mm -hmm. You need theism or something like theism to get that. So these horrifying, I won't even say what they are. <laughs> sure, they're so yeah. Pleasant to think about, but basically philosophers point out things that happen in the animal kingdom that in a certain insect species or even the upper level animals happen and are just normal parts, you know, whether it be like, I'll mention some of the less extreme, less graphic ones would be like mothers who kill off their sterile daughters. So that mm -hmm. happens a lot in the animal kingdom. So the argument is we could have evolved such that that would be a sacred duty. That would be morally that, that we'd feel uh, that this is right. Right. Mm. And, and those those Darwinian counterfactuals point to how what a bad spot we're in. If all we have are the evolutionary mechanisms to explain mm. why morality feels the way it does, why justice feels the way it does. Do you mind if I just hop in? So so the argument is that. Um... Like we have this sense, so to speak, that our moral, you know, our moral values and duties aren't just arbitrary, right? So for instance, if we just have the evolutionary mechanism, then yeah, I mean, it's kind of arbitrary, right? Because maybe we end up like, um, you know, like we, we end up with the tradition of killing our um, sterile daughters or, you know, I know some animals eat their young when they just don't have enough food or resources, right? Um, our intuition is that, man, but like, we can't imagine a world in which it would be different for us, so to speak. Cause like, there's something that just seems absolute about our moral values. And so is it, is the argument that you're trying to show that um, the, if we only have the evolutionary mechanism, then it seems as if we have to accept our moral values are kind of arbitrary, but that's precisely what we reject, right? When we think about morality. Yes. And I go into all this more in the, in the book, but to yeah. so essentially canvas it I, it, I I am making it as an abductive argument, which means an inference to the best explanation. Right. So mm -hmm. the way I'm casting it is kind of like, so I, I start off the chapter just explaining conscience. I just talk about how conscience feels. And I just give lots of like anecdotes from literature, like C.S. Lewis has a, in his, that hideous strength. There's a scene where the character like discovers the power of how good and evil feel. And so mm -hmm. I just talk about, Whatever interpretation we put on those feelings, we all can relate to that. We all know what it feels like, the darkness and anguish of when a helpless person is, is bullied or, you know, the, the, the heroism we feel towards someone who exhibits sacrificial love. We all know those feelings. And then I just say, look, here's theism, here's naturalism. Both of these have an explanatory framework for those feelings, which is the more plausible. And I argue that on naturalism, mm -hmm. those feelings become two things, illusory and arbitrary. Right. Okay. The, the Darwinian counterfactuals come in with the arbitrary point. The illusory point is to say they feel significant. Morality feels significant, but on an evolutionary paradigm where all you have are evolutionary mechanisms to account for those feelings, the, that feeling of significance is an illusion. It's just our brains tricking us. The actual reason we feel that way is because it helped animals survive. That's it. That's the sum total explanation. So that's, um, and very few people are willing to accept those, both those right. ideas. Mm. I mean, but, you know, Gavin, seeing like, you know, the force of these arguments, right? And especially like, I don't know, I just don't know how you get around the Kalam or at least the idea of there being a first cause. Why do you think uh, religion is on the decline, at least in the Western world, or just in general, um, even just a belief in organized religion? even if it's Baptist or Catholic or what have you, most people just want to be nuns, so to speak, and just like not have any affiliation, right? But maybe they have some generic belief in the supernatural. What's going on, Gavin? 
<laughs> oh, oh man, yeah. Whenever I use the word the nuns to my congregation, I have to clarify it's not the yeah. N N S. <laughs> it's the <laughs> N O N E S. And yeah, that is. I just was actually just this past week at our church. I was sharing this some of these statistics about just since COVID, the decline in church attendance, and uh, it is very sobering. I mean. The one thing that does help me is to see that that's more characteristic of the West. So there's yeah. lots of places mm-hmm. where, where religion is booming. And so that is, that actually really helps me, you know, just, just processing that. Um, so gosh, so why is it happening in the West? I mean, I'm sure there's many factors and I'm not really a sociologist, but I, so, you know, you can think of, I can think of a number of specifics that contribute to it. So there's the general trend of just secularization. You know, in the modern era, cultures tend towards secularization. That's a really interesting question to wonder why. Um, but then I think in more recent times, like what we were talking about at church this past Sunday, is just since COVID. I mean, I don't know. It has been such a brutal time for pastors. I I, mm-hmm. I really continue to hear for ministers and priests and others just the amount of discouragement and fatigue over the last two years a year and a half, you know, because of all the decisions and the polarization that's happening in our culture so that whatever policy I have as a pastor about masks, whatever it is, Mm. I can guarantee you there will be somebody on this side who thinks I'm too restrictive and someone on this side who thinks I'm not restrictive enough, you know, and every pastor faces that. Actually, at our church, I've been so blessed. Our church has been so supportive and so gracious, but um, really, but I know so many pastors are facing that where whatever you do, and so um, I'm sure the recent circumstances related to the pandemic have had an impact that we can only fully discern with some time to look back in hindsight, but it's not been uh, good. And then I think of scandals, you know, mm-hmm. thinking in like in the Protestant world, uh, uh, among evangelicals, there have been a lot of ministers who have really let us down. And that hurts people. Um, people become disillusioned by that. I understand that. It's a when you've been personally wounded, it's hard to pull apart the emotions of that and the um, intellectual side of that. It's right. hard. I, I can know in my mind the fact that that pastor is not Jesus. I know that, so I know that it's not a reason to stop trusting Jesus because I don't trust him. But emotionally, it's not always easy to pull that apart. And so I'm sure that a lot of the scandals and um, ministers who have had moral failings have contributed. I think about like, what, what, what must it feel like if you became a Christian under the preaching of a particular minister who subsequently is now apostate and yeah. the things he's doing as an apostate person are really like scandalous. Like that must be hard to work through that. And even though I might know, well, God can still work through this minister, even despite that, it still emotionally can be hard to work through that. So, um, gosh, yeah, we, we're in trying times. And again, that I come back to just saying, okay, uh, I'm going to keep doing whatever I can do to try to be a voice of help and reconstruction for people. And the other thing that encourages me is just remembering that the kingdom of God does seem to be seasonal in some ways. Mm. And what I mean by that is it does seem to have certain times where it's, it's um, appearing to bear fruit more copiously than at other times. And I, what encourages me the most is in my own ministry with Elijah, I always think about in first Kings 17 and first Kings 18, it's the same guy and he's being equally faithful to God. But in one chapter, he's off in Zarephath in the heart of Baal worship with one Gentile widow and her son. His ministry is as modest and meager as you can imagine. Um, and then the next chapter, it's fire from heaven. Right. <laughs> uh, the drought is over, revival. So you go from, my, my wife and I talk about these images all the time. In First Kings 17, it's survival. It's the jug and the jar won't run out. Miraculous provision so you don't die during the drought. That's what ministry feels like sometimes. First Kings 18, it's fire from heaven. <laughs> it's like, you know, incredible. It's as powerful as can be. And it's the same guy and he's equally faithful and he's equally gifted. And so what helps, I think about this a lot that for pastors and other, just all Christians, you know, sometimes we are in a first Kings 17 season and we just can't give up because we don't know what might be down the road and whether God is doing fire from heaven or the jug in the jar, not running out 
um, actually, we still had just have the same calling, just walk in obedience to God and trust in him and look to him. And so that kind of helps me. I think we're more in a first King 17 season now, <laughs> but it helps me to keep going to realize that and say, what doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. Who knows what God might do? Yeah. Yeah. The, I think, I think you hit it right in the head when you talked about just the trauma that a lot of people have. And I really appreciate just the more that I, I'm listening to you, just you take really seriously, you know, those people who have been harmed by the church or who have felt disillusioned somehow with religion. Um, I think that that's something that a lot of people in the religious world today, you know, evangelical, Catholic, whatever, whatever you name it. Um, I don't think they're appreciating the fact that for them, like a lot of people do want to believe that there's a God. A lot of people do want to believe in the resurrection and so on and so forth, but they just can't believe that there is goodness in the world left anymore, that there's anything to look forward to. And so it reminds me of when, um, you know, Jesus visits, uh, you know, Mary and Martha after Lazarus has died. And I think it's Martha who says, you know, Jesus asked her, do you believe that I'm the resurrection, the life, right? And then she says, yes, I believe that, you know, we will all be raised in the last day. And she, so she's thinking like, the hope that's coming, that's, that's down the line, right? Lazarus, he's dead. It's all, it's done for him, right? And Jesus is saying, no, I am the resurrection, the life. I'm right here, right now, you know? That's what people need. They need good ministers who can be the resurrection, the life for them right now. But uh, speaking of which, Gavin, tell me, um, you know, I, I remember you mentioned that, you know, you have a brother, I think you said, who's Presbyterian, right? So you have some theological diversity, obviously, in your family. So wh why do you think that you... Um, are Baptists, you know, why, why be Baptist rather than the other denominations you could have been? Right. And my other brother is also Anglican and my sister is Anglican too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we're all, all over the, the map, I guess. Um, yeah, it is certainly not because I'm like, oh, this tradition is good and the others are bad. It's, it's nothing yeah. like that. I'm more ecumenically minded. I have great admiration for many other Christian traditions. I kind of look over the fence at other Christian traditions that, wow, you know, there's so much to admire here. Um, I, I also think that there's a lot about the Baptist world that needs renewal and needs reform and, and so forth. So it's not like I think, you know, um, I, I, in fact, some people have negative associations with the word Baptist, and to some extent, I kind of understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it would come down to a couple of things just theologically for just seeking to follow my conscience in terms of where God has led me. One would be the nature of baptism as a sacrament and my understanding of that. Um, another would be the autonomy of the local church. Um this is one where the way I kind of think of it is like, I think G.K. Chesterton said, democracy is the worst form of government you can possibly fathom, except for all the other ones that have been tried. <laughs> and uh, I love that quote. And I sort of think of autonomy of the local church like that. Like, <laughs> it's the worst possible way you could do it. It's the most inefficient way you could possibly do it, except for all the other ways. Uh, because when you have an institutional overhead that is formally, because, you know, certainly as a Baptist, you have relationship and you have partnership and you have networks and associations and so forth, but formal accountability to an institutional overhead, the great, that can do a lot of good, but the worry is what if it goes south? <laughs> yeah. So fractionating down to the individual congregation is kind of like a good damage control policy in a sense. Um, and I, so that's another piece. And then the other piece is one of the things I do admire about the Baptist tradition and seek to I don't know, I resonate with it deeply is the value for uh, liberty of individual conscience. And at its best, I think the Baptist tradition has had a, a high appreciation for giving, avoiding coercion, you know, nonviolence. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., his philosophy of nonviolence, I really resonate with. And at its best, I think the Baptist tradition has really showcased that and valued that and lived that out, of course, none of our traditions embody our own values perfectly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so those would be three, three kind of distinctives of where it's not like um, this is, this is the truth and no one else has it. It's more like, this is where I find myself um, drawn based upon the convictions God has given me. All right, Gavin, let me ask you one last question. So, uh, and I'll combine the two on the docket just into one um, because I think you can, we can combine them, but um Who's your favorite church father and what's your favorite Christian doctrine? <laughs> uh, okay. This is a fun one. Uh, 
my favorite church father, I have to go with kind of a very uh, non, not surprising answer. And that's Augustine. Um, okay, nice. <laughs> it'd, it'd be great to find like some really obscure church father. No one's ever heard of, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, Augustine is, I, I just, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time reading Augustine and his, both his, um, both his love for God and his theological precision uh, are just unparalleled to me. When I read through the confessions, for example, I, I, I find it such a um, powerful and uh, winsome uh, book, maybe my favorite book, perhaps. Um, and then my favorite doctrine would be, and Augustine, by the way, has helped me a lot on the creation stuff. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about him, and he's really insightful about uh, Genesis. My favorite doctrine would be heaven. Some people don't like mm. the term heaven. Um, so you could just think of it as our enjoyment of God after the final resurrection. Okay. And uh, I love thinking about that. This is where Anselm gets to in the Proslogion. It's where he ends up as he's talking about heaven and he talks about it as a multiplication of joy, you know? Uh, so the way love multiplies the joy of heaven, he's saying in heaven, you'll obey the golden rule perfectly. So your joy in heaven will make me twice as happy uh, hmm. than I would be if it was just me in heaven. Cause I'm, cause I love my neighbor as myself. So I'm equally happy at your joy as mine and then vice versa. And then add in a, a third person and add in the angels and add in all the saints and angels. And you've got this reverberation of joy hmm. compounding infinitely because of the love of heaven. And I remember when Anselm taught me that and just thinking, Every time I think about it, it makes me happy to anticipate. Uh -huh. And it's it's such a, you know, it's the kind of thing. It's like you could think about that every day and it could give you enough strength to get through the day. It, because if you really believe that's where we're headed, um, it puts li this life in such perspective. So um, I love thinking about the doctrine of heaven. There's so much to it. You know, sometimes we just think of heaven as just like this more bland place. We're doing something. We know it's happy, but we don't think about the particulars of it. But if you really meditate upon the doctrine of heaven, there's a lot uh, that is more specific that I do think we can arrive upon, even though we can't fully anticipate what it will be like, that I just find nourishing and, and helpful for maintaining hope and joy and the right focus upon Christ each day. Yeah, if I had to answer that question, I'd say, for me, Irenaeus, mm -hmm. and then my favorite doctrine, the Incarnation. Man, oh man! But like you know, the answer that you gave too. I don't hear enough people talking about heaven nowadays. That, that, that isn't that kind of sad, you know? Uh, I feel like heaven is such a. I think people think that when you talk about heaven, you're just trying to distract from now, right? But in reality, it's like no. But the new Jerusalem, it's going to be you know the new heaven and the new earth, right? Like it, it's heaven's coming to us, so to speak, right? It's not us escaping from reality. It's us enjoying reality as it was meant to be, and that's just remarkable. <laughs> Oh, totally. I mean, it, it's so happy. Here's a final thought is just so happy yeah. to think about is we're thinking about Christ's resurrection as kind of the, the first fruits or like yeah. the, the first installment of heaven. So um, the fact that he's got his scars on his wrists still, and what that one, I talk about this in the book is, you know, um, what that means is the suffering of this life will not simply be like totally erased and forgotten. Mm. Rather, God will transform it into glory. And if you think about that for you personally, that is so powerful to think. And so I do the thought experiment at the end of the book when I'm trying to say from the argument from Christ's resurrection, trying to show the emotions of that. And I say, just imagine what if the worst pain of your life didn't just come to an end, but God actually somehow turned it into good and turned it into glory. Just imagine, you know, and, and then imagine that the happiest moments of your life are not over. They were just anticipations of what you'll get more fully ultimately uh, before the face of God. And, uh, you know, that, uh, the, the, what I say is that's, that's an indestructible hope, you know, <laughs> that there's nothing that can take your joy away if you really believe that. Yeah. Well, Gavin, that's beautiful. And I think this was just a great conversation with you. And so, dude, I appreciate everything that you do. I appreciate your channel, the candor that you show, and obviously the intellect that you have, it's, it's just fully on display in this interview and in all your work. And so, Gavin, thank you so much for your ministry. Thank you, Swan. It was so kind of you to have me on and just do this. I consider you a friend and you're likewise, you are doing incredible work. So I just feel so honored to be able to talk with you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you, Gavin.